Um, boy, I have a lot, to th- a lot of things to do tonight. Um, we, you know, I've been thinking about this for quite some time, and so and it's dangerous when I think, but especially when I don't think things through is when I really get in trouble, but, uh, and I'm guilty of that. But I have uh, just been around church life enough to know that uh, the way that God moves most of the time is through a whole church at the same time, and it seems like that when he does that, it goes to another level. It just happens that way, and uh, it seems to be that that's the way he did it biblically, biblically too, and I won't have time to go in that. But we are starting our 40 days of community in uh, a few weeks, and uh, we believe in uh, BHAGs. Now, how many of you know what a BHAG is? Okay, let me tell you what a BHAG is. It's called, um, what is it called? A Big, Hairy, Audacious Goal. I'll try it on this side of the room. It's called a Big, Hairy, Audacious Goal. And I just find out that God just loves when we, uh, we kind of figure out, well, we think this is where you're going, and then just challenge ourselves towards that. We roughly have about 150 or 160 small groups right now. And we're believing God that we're going to have 300 small groups with 3,000 people going into these small groups. Now, that means this. Those of you that are in small groups need to divide and multiply and start a new group. And I will be talking to you later. But it has to be specific. What we are trying to do is we're trying to get, gather believers and your relatives and your friends into these small groups. Because what we're going to do is challenge you through this 40 days of community to go into the community. But first, we have to become a community. So we want those of you that know, and you will know by the end of this message too tonight. uh, Whatever. You know, I was thinking about that. Uh, Ronnie got cut off off tonight, and he responded so good. (laughs) Didn't he? Yeah. So here's what I want you to do. I want those of you that know you're supposed to divide and break off from your small group to fill this out, give it to uh, the information center back there, and uh, believe God that he's going to do some incredible things as we start. And all I can tell you this is I've been in these 40 days of community meetings with our leadership team, and it's all lay people that are over it, and, it, and the excitement is just, I mean, it, God just fills the room. Sometimes we just cry because of what we see uh, God's going to do through this. And so uh, be in prayer about it. Start marking your calendars. More information is going to be coming out, and uh, we're real excited about it. Aren't you? Now, uh, this little piece of paper. Every one of you need this little piece of paper. If you do not have this little blue piece of paper, would you please raise your hand? Ushers are around and they will pass these out to you. You need to have this. And if you're there and saying, I don't need it, and you're not raising your hand, God will get you. (laughs) See, and most hands that just went up then were guys. Okay, I'll play. All right, I want you to have this. And then... I want you to think of this like your Bible for the next couple of weeks, okay? I want you to recognize that we're believing that God's going to do a lot in you these next couple of weeks as we, as we uh, deal more in depth about learning to recognize the Holy Spirit. And tonight we want to talk about our gift survey. Now, spiritual gift survey. And the only one that, uh, scripture that I'm going to deal with, and then we'll deal with the rest of them next week, is 2 Timothy 1.6. So if you want to turn... To 2 Timothy 1.6, that's what we want to talk about. Hopefully this message will help you identify and recognize the gifts God has placed within you. These gifts that God has placed within you have been given to help you serve in the kingdom. Somebody emailed me this this week, and I just want to share it with you. I thought it was just really incredible. The world has differing ideas what makes an individual great. Most often we associate it with power, wealth, and celebrity. The Bible suggests a different way to greatness. The way of a servant, greatness is found in living for others. 
For most of his career, Albert Einstein kept the portraits of two scientists on the wall, Newton and Maxwell. Toward the end of his life, he replaced those portrait, uh, portraits, 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 with Gandhi and Albert Schweitzer. He said it's time to replace the image of success with the image of service. Maybe he had been inspired Schweitzer's words, I don't know. I don't know what your destiny will be. But one thing I know, the only, one, the only ones among you who will be the truly happy are those who have sought and found how to serve. I imagine that we are all on something of a self-directed journey towards greatness. Let's remember that the path is paved with service to others. If you want to be great, learn to be the servant of all. Listen to what Jesus said. Whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Think about these thoughts about greatness. There is a great man who makes every man feel small. But there are really great men or men that makes everyone feel great. No man is truly great who is great only in his lifetime. The test of greatness is the page of history. No man ever became great as he pleased or did as he pleased. Little men do as they please. Little nobodies. Great men submit themselves to the laws governing the, the realm of great success. Great minds have purpose. Others have wishes. Little minds are tamed and subdued by misfortune. But great minds rise above them. It's all about service. People in the skirt, uh, scripture who left a legacy were ones that learned, now listen to this, friends, learned to serve within their gift mix. The first one is this, is Abraham. Think about Abraham. Now, Abraham was a man that just simply obeyed God, used his gift of faith, and became what? The father of faith. Because he, he moved in faith. And so we learn lessons from these people, that when you move in faith, we're supposed to model Faith. We have another guy by the name of Moses, and he used his gift, his leadership, to actually lead a whole nation out of bondage and into freedom. God will always use leaders to be change agents, and we'll talk about this in just a minute. Then you have a guy by the name of Samuel. I love Samuel. Samuel's a prophet, and his prophetic gifting actually was used to bring a lot of change and reformation to a whole nation, placing kings in place. And bringing reformation to a whole nation because of this strong prophetic gifting. And see, here's one of the problems when we start talking about these people and the patriarchs of the Old Testament. Is that most of us in here going, you know, that's just not me and I just don't have that. And that, that is not true, friends. You know, we may not be used at that level, but God wants to use us all. Another one that just came to my mind, and I, I really have a purpose in sharing that in this, and that is Esther. Esther in the Old Testament. And you know what she was really used for? Intercession. She was used in a place to pray and actually get a whole nation to pray that alleviated the potential of their anni annihilation. And so when we begin to see all these people and recognize that we're still learning from them today, it's because largely they operated within the gifts that God has given to them. And they left an impact upon the world. George Barna, who is a Christian pollster, in his book, uh, book The Leading Spiritual Indicators, suggests that 71% of church people have heard of spiritual gifts. 71% of us in here have heard of spiritual, spiritual gifts. But his study does indicate that very few people actually are convinced that they have spiritual gifts. Learn about them, but not convinced that they have them. He goes on to state that only 22% of any church adult population can identify their spiritual gifts. Have you ever heard of the 80-20 rule? Or the 20-80 rule? 20% 20 of the people do 80% of the work? 20% of the people eat 80% of the food? You know? 20% uh, of the people can identify their, their spiritual gifts. I believe what the Spirit of God is wanting to do during this series is help us identify these gifts. Now, 
When I begin to identify these gifts, I want you to know that this in and of itself is going to be a spiritual exercise for you. And you're going to have to be very, very aware of what your spirit is saying to you about these gifts. And this is how it's going to work. And, and I want you to dial into this, friends. If you forget everything else that I say this evening, don't forget this. Because the Spirit of God is here to touch you in areas. And what you're going to find out is that when I begin to describe these gifts, you are going to peak an interest over some. And so in your little blue outline, I want you, there's a, there's a box there. I, when, when, when you feel, boy... That sounds like me, and something lifts in your spirit. I want you to put a plus by that. Now, if, if I talk to you and you feel like you're going to sleep on, on a particular gift, then put a minus in there. You know why? And let, let me tell you why. I think it's really important for us to, to do this. is because you can begin to identify what is your gifts by eliminating those ones that aren't. You see? So put that in there. Now... Uh, Interestingly enough, friends, that in my quiet time today, and I'm in, in Thessalonians right now, and Paul is, is exhorting the Thessalonica church how to live in a world that is really out of kelter, and then he, then he, just out of the blue, and you can go check this for yourself, he says, warn those that are idle. Warn those that are idle. And... Uh, I couldn't get past that. So I just kept going over and over. And this is the way my mind works. And so your may not, mind may not work this way. Uh, but I have the microphone. So here's how it goes. I started thinking about the things that I really enjoy. And especially around motors and fast cars. And Fast boats and fast airplanes and fast motorcycles and all that. And you know what I started to think about those things? They weren't built to idle. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? They, they're all built for, for motion. They're not built to be idle. And friends, let me say this to you. You were not built to idle. Just pat, pat, pat around. You were put, made to, uh, you know, put your pedal to the metal, so to speak. And so here's what I, I want you to begin to think about. There are only two wrong answers that you can give on this survey. The first one would be this, that you have all the gifts. Now we've got another problem. And the second wrong answer would be this, that you have none of the gifts. And those are the only two wrong answers that you have. Now, out of this scripture tonight, out of 2 Timothy 1.6, Paul says to Timothy, I want you to flam it, uh, uh, fan into flame the gift that God has given th to you through the laying on of hands. Now, let me explain that to you. Actually, I like it in the, in the King James that says... Uh, stir up the gift that God has given to you. Stir it up. But it came through the laying on of hands. Now, friends, I want you to know that we're about ready to do something that a lot of Western Coloradians do not like to do. And I'm just going to ask you, uh, in a very kind way, get over it. But I want to kind of turn this whole message into a clinic tonight. And Paul says, this is a very scriptural thing, is to lay your hands on other people and to pray for them. And so I would like you to grab the hand of the person next to you. Now, to you guests, before you do this, let me say this. Uh, it's probably okay to state your name before you grab that person's hand. <laughs> we'll, we'll let you be that friendly. But I, I want you to, honestly, right now, I want you to grab the hand of the person next to you and we're going to pray together, God, now stir up the gifts. Stir them up. It's exactly what Paul did. Amen? Now, Lord, we come before you and we recognize uh, this is really a great moment. And we don't just say, stir up the gifts. We say, Lord, really, stir up the gifts. Let us recognize, Lord, that you have given us gifts 
And you want us to, to use these gifts to further your kingdom and bless your body. Bless us with this understanding, and we'll give you the praise for it in Jesus' name. And everyone said, now, if you will look, take this out, you will recognize that there are 16 gifts. And all I can say is buckle up. Because if I spend two minutes on each one, that's 32 minutes. And I am going to get you out of here on time. So, here we go. Four categories. Now, understand this, that when I, we go to categories, then you'll open it up. Category two, category three, and then category four. All right? So, four categories of gifts. The first one of this are relational gifts. The first one of, uh, of relational gifts is this, the gift of encouragement. Now, these individuals like to come alongside others who are discouraged and encourage them. Don't you love these guys? They come alongside and encourage. These people constantly paint a picture of God's goodness and direction for those who are discouraged. These people know when someone needs to be encouraged and have, always, have ways to encourage them. And it's always amazing to me how people who have this gift just have a knack to give you something right at the moment that you need it. Like you'll got, many of you have encouraged me in ways that you will never know just because you've sit, uh, sat, da sat down and wrote, wrote out a note to me. Mailed it. And it's just one of those moments. And you've experienced that too. Or somebody uh, just gives you a special little gift. And they come up and just give you a card and say, you know, I was praying and thinking about you and you open it up and you just, you just man... I mean, before you had that experience and then you walk away from it, it's like night and day. And then here's the best one I like is, are those people that are really keen to, uh, dialed in to food. <laughs> you know those ones that bring you cookies and uh, chocolate chip, by the way. No. Uh, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? They have the gift of encouragement and they come alongside and they just encourage at the right time. Number two is this, the gift of evangelism. Now, most people would think of Billy Graham, who has the gift of evangelism, but in an upfront sort of way. He has the ability to speak to thousands, and people come to the Lord. I just heard that uh, he did something out in L.A., and thousands, I don't know how many, came to the Lord, made decisions for the Lord. Most individuals who operate in this gift do not function in the upfront but rather in a relational sort of way. And let me tell you how it works, friends. And there's many of you in here that have this gift. And what you do is you come alongside somebody else and you begin to develop a relationship with them. And you are constantly thinking in your mind of ways that I can share the gospel. Now, you don't want to be a nag or obnoxious about when you share the, the gospel, but you are winning this person through relationship. And let me just say this to you. It's one of the key ways that God is going to use in the 21st century. And one of the reasons why God is going to use this is simply because people are leery of big programs. But when a friend really develops a relationship, and friends understand this, really get a hold of this, God will open doors for you to begin to communicate with that individual about the gospel. He just does it. But it's all through a relational type of of method. Now, here's, a, here's another thing that really happens to individuals. We know for a fact that the number one phobia that Christians have is sharing their faith. They're afraid to do it for whatever reasons. And if you haven't gone through Connect 101 yet, one of the reasons that we have the kind of church that we have is for you to bring your friends and we will pull the trigger for you. See, and that's, that's, that's that evangelistic gift that is just going, I want my friend to experience this. Of anything that I can possibly think of, this is what I would want more than anything, is my friend or friends to come to the Lord. Number three is this, the gift of hospitality. These people have the ability to make others feel welcome and at home, whether in their own home or at church. They love to see others come together due to their efforts and discover friendship and relationship. When unexpected guests show up, and this is just amazing to me, they always have enough food. <laughs> we know of somebody like that. And it's just, it's just like they were, they were planned on. You know? No, come on in. Sit down. And before that person leaves, you know, their shoes are off. 
They feel like they're a part of the family. Now let me just say something about the gift of hospitality. Every ministry, every area of the church needs this gift. You know why? Because God is constantly welcoming people home. And they need to feel this gift. They need to sense this gift. That's why people that are out there, greeters, should have the gift of hospitality. When people walk through the door, and you know that. Some of you are just charged to meet new people. You have the gift of hospitality. And you're out there shaking hands, and there's like no barrier. Why is that? It's because God has gifted you with that gift of hospitality. People just feel at home when they're around you. Number four is this, the gift of leadership. They can cast a vision. These people are able to motivate, encourage, and direct people towards a common goal. These, these individuals love to see others excel in their gifting and become productive. They instill within a group of people not only the ability to see the future, but faith to accomplish the future. You know, Moses just didn't come in and go, man, we're getting to the promised land. He created enough faith because of what God was doing to say that is the promised land and that's where we're going. Interesting, this gift. These people are change agents used by God to help people reach their full redemptive potential. And let me just say this about the gift of leadership. God will always change societies and world and communities and cities and churches and organizations and everything else through the gift of leadership. And it's something that needs to be honored. As a matter of fact, when you go through the gifts in Romans chapter 12, it's the only one that God's, or that Paul actually talks about and says, do it with all diligence. And there's, like, there's, a, there's another category of accountability that leaders have. Do it with all diligence. Number five is this, the gift of mercy. These people look for the ones who are hurting and suffering and are in need of some TLC. These people act like a triage center. They can tell who is really in the di most dire need. These people move towards individuals who are strays. Have you ever noticed people like that? They just have a calling to the people that are strays. And you go to their house and they have lots of animals that are strayed because they just can't bear for that little animal to be out there without a family. And so they are motivated towards these individuals. Their largest concern is these people are moved back into the family. They want to make sure that these individuals are nurtured and cared for. All right? The gift of shepherding, number six. These people have the ability to nurture, care for, and direct individuals towards maturity in Christ. Most of these people make wonderful, small group leaders. Hello. Is the Spirit of God blowing on some of you? You see this? You know what to do with it, don't you? Now, friends, let me just say this. I hear a lot of papers rattling at this particular time, but don't, don't miss this. Some of you right now, is having a, you are having a spiritual experience, and it's not because Pastor Dan. The Spirit of God is breathing upon you, and your heart is beating right now, and you know that this is an area that you are supposed to be involved in. You just can't get away from it. And God is saying, this is what I want you to do. Now, one of the ways that you can tell about these individuals, that they are highly relational and enjoy staying in touch with people. Usually, you have to remove their phone surgically from their ear because they are constantly in contact with people and they love to be in contact. That's the gift of shepherding. That's the gift of pastoring. That's the gift of caring. And let me just, I wish I had time to wax eloquent on this, although I'm, I, I can never do that anyway, but I just wish I had the time to really talk about this. Friends, uh, and there's no gift that's more important than the other, but this is where a lot of people are hurting simply because they do not have somebody that's caring for their souls. And the reason why you are hurting and in the shape that you are spiritually is because you will not come under someone else and recognize that this thing is a lot about social well-being and being connected with the rest of the body of Christ in a small group setting. And people will care for you. 
and take care of you. And it's not just a place to receive from, but it's also a place to give, okay? I already heard you've already changed the page, so I don't have to tell you to do that. Gifts of serving. Number one is this. Gift of administration. You have been gifted by God to see how an organization functions. These people are detail-oriented. Oh, God, I love these people. <laughs> you know, they love details and have the ability to bring order out of chaos. Now, let me just stop and just say something about this. I think that everybody needs, and I, I know that there are people in here that would disagree with this particular statement, but I've been around this long enough to know this. Most leaders function in the leadership gift. They do not function in management. And most people that function in management do not function in leadership. But I am absolutely convinced that the maximum that happens through any kind of leadership is when these two come together and recognizing they're not in opposition, but they are actually mutually uh, benefiting one another. See, I can tell you which came first, friends, the chicken or the egg. The chicken. And you're going, what in the world are you talking about? I'm talking about leadership and management. And leadership always comes first. And you know what they do? They create all the jobs. For the managers. <laughs> so we don't have to worry about the details. We really are in la la land. I, I, as a matter of fact, I was talking to a lady in our church that has this gift, and she said, Dan, there isn't a mess I've met that I don't like. <laughs> okay, I'll move on to the next one. I thought that was pretty good. Okay, the next one is this gift of craftsmanship. Exodus 31, 1 to 3. And by the way, these are throughout the scriptures, obviously. bel zel -ul. <laughs> Now listen, this guy, God empowered this man with craftsmanship to build the tabernacle in the wilderness. That's a huge task. These individuals love to make things with their hands. These people comfort others because they are able to build or fix those things that other people cannot build or fix. I love you. You do not want Pastor Dan to come over to your house to fix anything. Because it will cost you more. And to have these people come in and do things is just wonderful. As a matter of fact, in a very profound way, I was moved to tears this last Christmas when Gene and Terry Hewitt invited me to Craftsman for Christ uh, Christmas party. And there were probably 50 or 60 ladies and men in this uh, in our fellowship hall and they were having their Christmas dinner and talking about all the things that they did this last year and it was just incredible the way that they helped people practically in our town you couldn't sit in that meeting and listen to what was going on without something welling up in your throat and going wow this is what it is when people have the gift to do something with their hands and Gene said this and he, he, he just said it in a way he had absolutely no way of knowing the impact that this had upon me. He said, uh, he said Dan, I just, I just want to, th it was in front of all these people. He says, I just want to thank you uh, for creating a spot where I can serve. He says, because I can't go to the children. I can't be in the nursery. But I can use my hands. And he said, just thank you for giving me that opportunity. We have another uh, ministry here called God's Garage. And these guys, you know, just say, put a wrench in my hand, and if there's a single mom out there or a family that's hurting and they can't afford it, I want to turn a wrench. You know, I, I may not be able to talk to them about the gospel, but man, I can do something like that, and I feel so good. You see, and God has gifted people to use your hands to bless other people with. Number three is this, the gift of giving. Now, let me just stop and say this before I go on here. See, a lot of people go, well, you know what? Uh, I don't have to do certain things in my life because I do not have that gift. Well, baloney. God will ask you to do things. As a matter of fact, at the end of this message, I'm going to ask you to do something that probably you've never, ever done in your life for some of you. And God will put you into positions. I mean, you, you don't see the Apostle Paul, you don't see Jesus, you don't see Peter coming into a situation and they're going, you know, I know these people need to be fed or she needs to be raised from the dead, but I just don't work in the gift of miracles. They don't do that. 
See, as a matter of fact, let me just say this to you. I think that God inspires at times for you to do things that you are not normally gifted for. But you will find out that you will function in a few gifts more predominantly than you will in other ones. And you just start keying in on that because you recognize this is the area that God is really using me in. And gift of giving. Friends, every one of us have the responsibility to give. But then there are these. God has given these individuals the ability to make money and develop resources that are channeled back into the kingdom of God. No matter what these people touch, they have the ability for it to turn to gold. Now, let me tell you something about these people. These people know when they are being manipulated. They absolutely know. They are wise individuals. But they also know when God's Spirit is speaking to them. And they've also come to the realization that it is God that has given them the power to make wealth. You see? And actually, and I introduced this to you last week, and I think it to be absolutely true, and I'd like for you to really think about this, is that these individuals get a buzz, an absolute buzz, out of watching their resources change people's lives. And it's a wonderful gift. And it's a wonderful thing that God has given to these people. You see? And so they're to be honored and they're to be uh, appreciated, but no more than anybody else. Simply because God has gifted them in this area. And thank God for them. Number four is this. Gifts of help. These people come alongside others. Now notice this. When the load gets too heavy and they want to lift the load from others. They just see people and they're under this load and they just want to come along and they want to help. These people love to be given a job to do, but they don't want the attention drawn to themselves. So that's why I went out and took some pictures of them and I'd like to show them. No, <laughs> not really. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, we have a lot of these people around this place that just have the gifts of help. And they just come alongside and they see somebody that's burdened and they just go, I want to help you. I don't want any attention for this. I just want to, I just want to help you. The gift of helps. And you have the ability to see into situations that you know that that individual needs a lot of help. And it can be either in the church or privately or wherever the case might be. And you just come along. And when you walk away after you helped this person, you are more energized than when you went into the room or went into the situation. And that's the way that this gift actually works. All right? Number three is this. How are we doing? Upfront gifts. Number one is this. The gift of apostleship. I hate that word. I know it's a biblical word, but it's what we've done to the word that I don't like. It's because we put people in realms that they don't belong. These individuals have an entrepreneurial spirit. They like to start things. They start organizations, ministry, businesses, whatever, oversee them, make sh and then they make sure they are functioning and then move on. The thing that kills the entrepreneur is when he has developed something and then he walks away from it and sees it dies. It just about kills him. Now, let me tell you something about these entrepreneurial people. You have to watch out if you have this gift. Because what you will do is you'll begin to develop so many things that you will wear out or burn out. And guess where the enemy loves to put you? You entrepreneurial people. He likes to put you in a place that you are so worn out that the first thing you give up is the kingdom of God. And yet that's the very thing that he has, he has given to you to spur, you know, God's kingdom on with. Now let me just tell you about these, these individuals here. They're a little whacked out on timing. And that's why when we get around to the gift of discernment, they have to have somebody around them that has enough authority in their life and somebody that they trust enough to say, slow down. Because what you're going to do is you're going to ruin your life. You've got all these ideas, but you've got to learn the timing of these. As a matter of fact, I've been around some prophetic people, and one of the toughest things that they can do, and we'll talk about prophets here in just a minute, one of the toughest things they, they have to do is determine the time, and their time is just whacked out. And it's the same thing with these entrepreneurial people. They see all sorts of things. And you know what really happens to them? Listen to me, friends. They get an adrenaline rush. And the more they get going, the more that comes. And you just got to get back to the place and saying, wait a minute, I need somebody around me that really can harness me in so I don't 
blow a rod. <laughs> Number two is this, gift of communication. They do have the ability to communicate God's word on a level uh, people can understand. Now, friends, I've had a revelation on this one, and you are not going to believe where I'm going to go on this. But this gift is multi-leveled. There are people who are gifted to communicate in a non-verbal format. God has gifted these people in the arts. This, this will... Now, please don't understand. Uh, I mean... <laughs> please do understand. <laughs> uh, you know, one of the things, you know, what we've tried to create in this church is a place where you can bring your friends into. And I teach this in Connect 101. Uh, we just don't let people dance around here. I mean, like out in the aisles and stuff like that. And the reason why, it's just too weird. Unchurched people come in, and they go, what is that? And they run them right back out the door. So we've just said, you can't dance. And... Uh, and now I'm faced with this, but this is the way that God uses to communicate his gospel to people that your verbal gift will not reach. And I think that there's going to be a whole core someday. I can't believe I'm saying this. <laughs> of, you know, of drama people, of dancers that dance, and all this kind of stuff that starts. Now, don't start calling me. Remember timing. And there's got to be somebody that leads this thing, you see, and all the rest of it. But you, you recognize, see, here's what happens, is that God will take these kind of gifts and he will communicate to somebody through these gifts that other gifts will not reach. And so there's communication gifts that go all over the place. Uh, people get to use their giftings when they're used like that. Number three is this, the gift of prophecy. This gift has the ability to speak to people on a personal basis. It calls people to a decision. It brings moments of incredible clarity. Go back and read about Nathan in the Old Testament. Prophetic. And he sets up a story for King David when King David, David uh, sinned with Bathsheba. And he talks about this poor man that just had a few lambs and a rich man came in and took this lamb. And David rose out of his chair and he said, that man should die. And, and Nathan goes, you're the man. You talk about moments of incredible clarity. The prophetic gift has the ability to bring you to a place of moments of clarity and then call you to a decision. And friends, let me tell you something. There, there are prophetic people around that speak the word of the Lord, and, and it's not with thus saith the Lord, but you just know you've been in the presence of God because when they've spoken to you, you know it. Okay? Uh, number four is this, the gift of teaching. Right? Gift of teaching. The gift, this gift functions in such a way that it makes individuals understand God's truth. These people have the ability to boil down, now notice this, the essentials and disregard the unimportant. These individuals derive great joy in watching the light bulbs go off. Now let me just tell you about this. I had a friend of mine that actually um, uh, was an older man and when he started to teach there was something that happened. I mean to tell you, friends, light bulbs started going off in my head. He recognized it. And he would spend time with me. He'd actually seek me out and sit me down. And I would seek him out. Because every time I talked to this guy, I got revelation. And there's something about when you start getting revelation in your mind, when you start getting truth, it just ignites everything in you. And there's people that have that ability to communicate God's word to such an extent that light bulbs start going off. You see, as a matter of fact, let me just say this. There are authors, Christian or secular, boy, now there's a stretch for some of us, that have the ability to teach you things, and it's like every page that you read is written just for you. And all I can suggest when you find those people, stay under them. Stay around them. Because God is connecting and they have the gift of teaching and they're teaching you something. Okay? The last one. Support gifts. Boy, we've got to go. Number one is this. The gift of discernment. They have the ability to know the difference between truth and error. 
Now listen to this. No one person operates in any of these gifts 100% of the time, and it's especially true on this one. Okay? Gift of discernment. Uh, people who operate in this gift must refrain from the words, I told you so. <laughs> and be able to admit when they are wrong. Now, let me tell you this. Every one of us needs somebody around us with the gift of discernment. And it is amazing how God will allow your spouse to be your discernment. Okay? You just need those kind of people around. You're not seeing clear. You're acting crazy here. Come on, this is not right thinking. You like that gift, don't you? All right, number two, gift of faith. These people know, boy, man, thank God for these people. These people know when something will happen simply because God has made it clear to them. The people have an uncanny ability to believe God when all the circumstances are pointed in the opposite direction. This gift functions, friends, usually for other people. And this is how it works. You see somebody else that is really in need, and you just have a gift of faith that says it's going to be okay. And it can be in a family, it can be in finances, it can be in health, it can be in any kind of area, and you just know that this thing is going to happen, and that's called the gift of faith. God has planted that in you, and you work in that. The gift of intercession, number three. These people know that they are connected with God and he is listening to them. They sense and know where the war is raging and who it is raging over. And these people, friends, are the ones that will go into the closet, battle for you, or battle over a church, or battle over a situation, and when they walk out of that, they know that God has answered the prayer and, and the answer is coming. And just, just hear this. This church needs to be inundated with intercessors. You know, and, and these people are the ones that, I'll just be really honest with you, and I've said this a number of times, it is difficult. I, I, I pray, and most of the time that when I pray, I have to journal out my prayers. For you visitors, this means journaling. <laughs> and, I have to, and then I have to read them back to God, and these people can go into the closet and literally spend hours and think it was a few minutes. They get a hold of God. And, and, of, of anything that runs the church, friends, it's this. The fire that heats the whole house, the furnace that runs and, and keeps us all warm are those intercessors that pray and seek God. Number four is this, the gift of knowledge. Uh, they have the insight to people. And they have the facts, but it didn't come by empirical, da empirical data. They have been given this information by God to let individual knows, to know God is in the situation. Probably the language that is used is this. When you have a gift of knowledge and you just go to somebody and it's just like, it is so clear in your mind what this individual is going through and you just, you don't go up and say, hey, I've got the facts on you. You say something like this, uh, you know, if it fits the situation. You're really struggling, or I see you really struggling with your parents. Is that true? Or I see you really struggling in this area of finances, but you know in your heart that you have the facts. And that is a word of knowledge. That is something that God gives to you, and you just know it. Um, worship team, I want you to come up, because this is the last one. Hello, worship team. Oh, yeah, you're there. It's kind of like a prayer. Come up here, and here they come. Okay. The last one is this. It's the gift of wisdom. And here's how the gift of wisdom works. It's applying truth to a situation that brings res resolution to that situation. And probably the greatest uh, example of that, and if you go through the Lord's life, you can see this over and over and over again. You know, he is, he's talking to the lady that was caught in the very act of adultery. And he stoops down on the ground and he writes something out. And uh, then he stands up. Now here's the word of wisdom that came... And he says, uh, those without sin, you cast the first stone. Now that's a word of wisdom. Because it brought immediate resolution to the situation. God, I've watched this happen in situations, friends, in people's lives, and they don't even know they're being used. And they will speak something, and everybody in the room knows, that's the answer. 
It's like a gift from heaven. Whoa, it feels so good. See, because it was a gift of... Was, and of course, the, the biggest one is this, is uh, King Solomon in the Old Testament. Remember that? Two mothers before him. They both claim the same kid. He sits there. And I'm absolutely convinced, friends, when he goes into this thing, he has not a clue as to what the answer will be. But then a gift of wisdom comes. He says, bring in a sword. Divide the, pa- the, the baby in half. And the real mother goes, no! He says, give the baby to her. She's the real mother. Gift of wisdom. And God just gives us those things in situations so that he can be honored and lets people know that he's in the room. Now, here's, here's two gifts that we've left out. And I, I don't have the time to explain this, but the gift of miracles and the gift of healing. And here's what's going to happen right now. Some of you in this room need healing. You need healing physically. You need healing in your marriage. You need healing in your finances. Some of you need the gift of miracles. And we're going to worship the Lord. And I want you to remain seated. Now, let me, let me say this. Every one of us is going to have to keep our eyes open for what I believe God wants to do. So when you worship, worship with your eyes open and it's okay. And here's what I want you, those of you that are in need. I want you to stand up as we begin to worship. And you're, go, you're identifying yourself. I need prayer. And what I want you to do as people begin to stand up around you is I want you to stand up and I want you to lay your hands on them as we worship the Lord. And I want you to ask them this question. What is it you need prayer for? And friends, let me tell you this. It's, it's not how, how mature we are. It's about how available we are. And I'm just, I'm just going to ask you to put yourself on the spot and say, okay, God, because most people that think, or, you know, when you're in the church anyway, think you're a fool anyhow, so why not be all out of fool? And say, okay, God, I'm going to go the whole distance. I'm just going to lay my hands on people that are around me, and I'm going to believe you for the gift of miracle for the gift of healing, whatever they need, that you're going to work through me. So as we worship the Lord, you just begin to stand up. And then people, you begin to pray for those ones around you. Okay? Let's worship the Lord. And I really mean it. Be obedient to what God's telling you to do. Don't be ashamed. Everybody in here votes for you. Okay? Let's worship the Lord. We already have some people standing. I lift my eyes up to the mountains from you maker of heaven creator of the earth come on people back there come on stand up and start praying for people come on I lift my
go ahead and stand. Into the mountains, where does my help come from? My help comes from you, maker of heaven, creator of the Lord Jesus, we bless you tonight because we recognize that you have placed...